about that. I had it set up earlier. I don't know what I did, but I broke it. So that's a great start. Anyway, this is my son, Adam. He just graduated from high school, and he has <laughs> absolutely no desire to ever be a programmer. <laughs> However, he grew up in a different time than I did, and the browser has been part of his world for as long as he can remember. He goes there to do his schoolwork. He goes there to chat with his friends. He goes there to share his artwork, which is really important to him. And so even though he has no desire to be a developer, he's still written JavaScript. Um, it's been fascinating to watch him grow up in this world and adapt to it, but because one of the ways the humans adapt to the environment is adapting the environment to suit themselves, even people that don't necessarily have any desire to learn any programming will often start with something like JavaScript, a tool to get from point A to point B so that they can modify their environment and make it what they want. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons that JavaScript is everywhere right now, is people use it to do something that they want to have done. Um, and it's a means to an end, not an end in itself, like the car that gets you from point A to point B. A lot of people don't necessarily know how it works very well, but it still gets them there. Of course, there are dangers in this too. I think a lot of us have seen what can happen when you write code <laughs> to do something without knowing how it works. And I think this is one of the problems with JavaScript and why it's often so frustrating to developers, especially when you're working with legacy code. Um, it's great and there, to get things done, and there are good parts. Um, but when you glue a lot of parts together without really knowing how they work, it's easy to wind up with code that is more complex than necessary, difficult to understand, and when you want to try to make it work better, it's almost impossible to debug and figure out what's going on. One of the ways that people try to stick to the good parts is by using some sort of framework to build a web application. Um, it's a way to extract out a lot of behind the scenes things that need to happen um, for most web applications. And it's also a way of thinking about your web application and, tying, um, and organizing your code so that you understand what has what responsibility. They can do a pretty good job, but it can sometimes be intimidating because there are a lot of different frameworks out there and you have to pick one. Um, and also because now, in addition to learning about JavaScript, you, and of course HTML and CSS, if you're writing, writing a web application, you also now have to learn about the framework that you're using. And if you've been a web developer for a while, you probably have to learn about several frameworks over the course of time. Um, I know I have. And so here I'm just going to take a moment and talk a little bit about my journey, just to introduce myself, finally. Um, I'm Amanda Brown. I'm a senior dev at a small company in Pittsburgh called Jetpack Workflow. Uh, you can tweet at me if you want, if you see anything that uh, you have questions about or if you see anything that uh, I might be interested in learning, you should tweet at me or if you see anything that's wrong, please let me know. Um, these are a few, I've been professionally ordering computers around for more than a decade. And these are some of the languages that I've used. Um, and I try to, to use some like uh, other languages too, like normal English. <laughs> I might not be as good at it. But, um, but the last one here is one of my fa personal favorites. And so that's what this talk is about. It's an introduction to Elm. And um, we'll talk a little bit about what it is and the philosophy behind it. And we'll talk about the experiences I've had with Elm professionally. We'll talk about the Elm architecture, do a quick syntax review, and then we're going to try a live code demo. Of course, now the demo gods do not seem to be smiling upon me because none of my technology is working, but we'll try it anyway. Um, so if you go to elmlang.org, this is what it says about Elm. It says it's a delightful language for reliable web apps, and you can generate JavaScript with great performance and no runtime exceptions. I think that's a pretty good description. Um, but it doesn't mention a lot of the other great things about Elm. One of the coolest things about Elm, I think, is that there's an emphasis on gradual learning, so you can be productive without a deep dive. He wants to make it a language um, like JavaScript, where you can pick it up and do something useful right away. But the thing about Elm is it has built-in best practices, and it tries to... Um, 
sort of lead you along to develop the software in a way that's more maintainable in the long run. So, and it can also teach you a little bit more about functional programming and some of the ideas behind it and some of the ways these can reduce complexity. Some of the things we've already talked to, about today, like immutability, um, is kind of built into Elm. So that's pretty great. Evan Chaplicki is the benevolent dictator of Elm. He's the lead developer, and he originally started Elm as a senior thesis. Um, and it, he continued to work on it in a few different companies, Prezi and No Red Ink after that. And there's now an Elm Foundation as well. Uh, his initial goal with Elm was to rethink uh, GUIs from scratch, GUIs from scratch. And he thought, if I did not have to start with JavaScript, how would I want to write a web application? Um, so unlike the frameworks that are stuck with JavaScript as being what they're built on, he was able to think from scratch about the way that he would want to talk to the computer and the way that he would want to describe a web page in a way that makes sense and is simple to reason about. One of the nice things about Elm is it's new, but um, as it moves forward, you can see he keeps making it easier to use. He wants it to be a nicer way to build web applications. So um, if you've checked it out before and it looked a little bit complicated, perhaps you saw signals, um, they're gone. It's now a little bit easier to just jump in and have it do useful things. And you might think, why another language like this? There's a lot of things in the front end world. Um, and he's just doing, doing this because he thinks that it's needed and in, as far as competition. He's not trying to like outdo anybody or the, the philosophy is not that. They just want to do a good job with this language. And so they're focused more on that than anything else, which I think is pretty great. So Elm is compiled to JavaScript. Um, and in my development journey, I know I started with compiled languages and then enjoyed moving on to things like Ruby where I didn't have a compiler and that was pretty exciting. And now I wish I had a compiler <laughs> again. The Elm compiler is really nice. The messages are very useful and it's very fast. Um, and as we do the live demo, you'll get to see that you could do compiler-driven development even without knowing much about Elm because the messages are just that useful. Um, Elm is statically typed, which is how we can compile it. And um, it prevents a lot of bugs from Things like loose comparisons like you would have in JavaScript where the types are not equal. Um, they, they aren't the same type of something and you're comparing them and you think that you're getting a comparison that you're not. JavaScript's full of things like that. Uh, errors that can happen when global variables aren't set and that sort of thing. Um, not because of that, that's later. But it means that we can have some contracts and we can have some guarantees about our code. It means sometimes that you're going to be duplicating some code that you might not otherwise write, and so sometimes you can feel like you're typing a lot of things, but it's cheaper in the long run than having um, code that could perhaps be the wrong abstraction. And you can do things like define only the ways that you expect your code to communicate, so you can prevent errors from happening where things communicate that shouldn't be happening. And an interesting thing with Elm is JavaScript is just an implementation detail. Technically, this is a language that's meant for writing good user interfaces. Um, and right now, of course, the browser is the place where people are, so it compiles to JavaScript, but it could compile to anything. Elm is a functional language. Um, all of the functions in it are pure, although Evan prefers the term stateless, um, which means that anytime you provide arguments to a function and get something out, you should expect to always get the same thing out for the same arguments that you put into the function. Um, and it means that there's going to be no side effects. So you can't necessarily affect the outside world by anything in the function, which makes it great for testing because you can always you, you don't have to worry about any global effects happening or anything in your environment messing anything up. Whatever goes in, you can guarantee that the same thing will come out for the given input. But without side effects, how can you do anything? Um, Elm has managed effects in its system. So 
In the language itself that you're writing, it's for the, the web application, but the Elm runtime handles all of the um, behind the scenes things that need to happen. So if you want something to happen outside of your application, you tell Elm that, and then Elm will let you know when it's done at the end. You don't ever touch that stuff. So um, that's a nice guarantee there. And immutability is built in, um, which is nice because it means if you write new code, you can't accidentally break old code easily. Um, there are no accidental communication channels. Um, everything is its own thing, and it can never change. Um, and here's a bonus. Elm applications are very fast. Once they're compiled and Elm's handling the application in the browser, um, it's much faster. It's the smallest bar there. And it's comparing this against React, Angular, and Ember. And he also tried it against optimized versions, where he tried to learn the best ways to optimize um, code for these different frameworks. And it was still a lot faster and easier to optimize. Behind the scenes, Elm has a virtual DOM like React, and it's just very good. Another great thing about Elm is it's Elm all the way down. If you are building a web application and you decide to use something like React, you might wind up using a package manager like NPM or Yarn, Webpack to get all of your code together to deliver. You're using React. You might be using Redux. Um, you might be using TypeScript and Flow for type safety, and you might be using Immutable JS to provide the immutability, and all of these things are built into Elm. It has its own package manager, it has its own compiler, and it has, in, within the language itself, best practices encoded in the way that you use it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about my experiences with Elm in production. Um, we used it at a company I used to work with called TTM. In a Rails application, we made a wizard component that um, was a component in our system where users would go through and answer questions to complete a task. In our case, it was importing files. And it went pretty well. Um, but why did we decide to do this? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I was lucky in that I had a team that was interested in trying new things. And we were able to decide to do that, so we did. Um, and we already had, within our application and the code around it, we already had a bunch of frameworks, Angular, Backbone, and Marionette, vanilla JavaScript, and CoffeeScript, so why not one more? Um, <laughs> and in my opinion, I felt like we had a bit of a rough start to the project. And it was partly because none of us had any experience with Elm in the real world, um, so we weren't sure the best way to put our applications together. Um, so we, we kind of went back and forth a few times, and we had a few false starts in the beginning, and I, that was a little bit rough because we kind of um, spent a long time trying to decide how to organize our code. Um, and it might not have been the best component to have chosen to try to use Elm because it winds up being sort of a larger component, and if you decide to use Elm production to start, you might want to pick something smaller. Um, the other thing that was kind of difficult is in a Rails app, you probably would like it to compile, like with sprockets or something, and um, we didn't do that. We just compiled it manually and checked in the JavaScript when we were done as part of our proof of concept, just getting it in the system, and that was kind of a pain, too. But it worked out. Um, it started to really shine later on. Once we had something working and we started to want to refactor it to make it work better, it was really a joy to refactor because of the compiler. Um, you could go through and move code around and be sure that it was still going to work in the end if you got no compiler errors. And the compiler is very helpful at telling you how to fix the errors that you get. So it was actually pretty great. We didn't need to be so worried, I think, as we were in the beginning, that we were arranging things the right way. Because with Elm, it's so easy to move things around. And if you look at a lot of the um, discussion groups for Elm, that comes up a lot, where people ask, should we be splitting this stuff out into a separate file? Um, 
Is it better to have this function here or there? Is it better to split this into multiple functions? And the answer is usually just try something because it's really easy to change later. It's not a problem. Um, one thing we have been concerned about is having newbies come onto the team and have Elm and not know what to do. Um, but after we left the company, there was a, um, another thing that needed to be added and we had a developer from outside of the project team come in and work on it. And even though he had never worked with that kind of code before, he was able to do the project without much help. So that was pretty encouraging. Um, the finished product was pretty fast, which was pretty great. Uh, so would I recommend this? Maybe, <laughs> kind of like Carol said with Rust. Um, it can be great for learning functional programming. I thought it was a lot of fun. And it depends on what you're doing and who you're doing it with, of course. Um, you can make an app in Elm, an entire application, or you can make a small component that you use an existing application. If you're starting it new, you might want to make a smaller component. And then if you have to fill in gaps in a larger application, you can also uh, use JavaScript interop. So you can like talk to JavaScript and vice versa if you need to. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Elm architecture. Elm is a language, but it's also an architecture. And this describes how you generally make a web page in Elm. And this is kind of cool. And I was thinking about it when Chris was talking about how Heroku talked about 12-factor applications and sharing their knowledge. Um, it's kind of interesting to me in Elm that we have this architecture that is sort of like the distilled knowledge of lots of experiments and mistakes and sort of encodes some best practices from all of the things that they've learned over time. So you'll recognize some of this stuff, probably. Um, the Elm architecture does help keep your app healthy as you refactor and add features. And it looks kind of like this. There's unidirectional data flow. So you're going to have a model. And remember, the model's immutable, which just means that it can't change ever. Once you have that model, it's that model. And you have something that maps that model onto a view. And the view is just a normal HTML component and CSS, if you want that. So your data is always going to be in the model. And then you have a single function that always translates it to the view. So whatever the model is, if it's the same model again, you'll get the same view. But if it's different, the map may translate it differently. So if something happens in your application, say a user clicks on something, um, you update your model. And again, this is another um, pure function. And any input that you get to update will always give you the same output for that input. So you'll get another model, which is again translated through your map to the view. And it keeps going like that as we uh, go through. Here's a secret. I've never presented before, so <laughs> that's part of why I'm having a hard time here. OK. Um, <laughs> and this is, this is the way that all of the Elm apps work. So when you're building a web page, a lot of people just keep this. This is just sort of the skeleton of all of the code that you need for an Elm web page that has interaction with the user. Um, and you have your model, which, which is the data that you're trying to represent, and you have your update which is your function, or it can be several functions, depending on how complicated your application gets, that um, translates your model to a view. So your model will just be mapped to some HTML, and it'll fill in, and it's great. It actually is. Um, I'm going to do a demo, but before we do the demo, I thought we should go over some syntax, just so that you're a little bit familiar with it before we get started. A lot of the tutorials out there for Elm um, say to just try things and then see how it works, because a lot of these things are easier to see in action than to explain. So I won't necessarily go into too much depth in here, but maybe talk more about it when we're doing the live demo. First, we're going to talk about functions. Functions are first-class citizens in Elm. You can pass them around anywhere. Um, functions, if you're a programmer, I'm sure you're familiar with, usually take an input and return something. Um, so in JavaScript, a function looks like the one on the left, where you have a function declaration called square. You take in a number, and you return the number squared. And you call it like that, and it returns 4. The same function in Elm looks like the one on the right. 
You'll notice that there's a line at the top that looks a little funny. Um, that's the type annotation. They aren't strictly required when you're writing code in Elm, but they're actually very nice because they tell you exactly what the function will take in and what it'll take out. In this case, you can see it'll take in an int and return an integer. Um, and you call it with just a space. Here's a slightly more complicated function, and you'll notice the type annotation looks interesting um, because it's like a chain of things. It's not like the inputs and the outputs. And that's because you actually technically only have one input per function. It's automatically what they call curried. And that sounds complicated, but it's not really. It's just a way of building, um, the, making functions be building blocks to do something larger. So for instance, we had the method square, which we're using here in labeled square. And we see labeled square takes a string and it returns an int int string. The thing is, really what it does is take one int, but we'll skip that. OK. <laughs> um, really what it's doing is returning a method that takes a string and returns um, an int. And that is confusing. But what we're going to do is look here is the way that you call it is you pass in a string and an integer and you get back a string and ignore that second integer because that's a mistake. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but the thing is you can use it like this. You can call it with a string and an int and you get back a string. Or you can call it with a string and you get back a function that takes an integer and gives you back a string. So if we wanted that function, and you can see from our type annotation, high square is a function that takes an int and gives back a string. Um, you can define it with labeled square high. And then if you call high square with just an int, you get a string at the end. So that's a more explicit way of looking at the way that the functions are put together. Elm also has records. Records are like hashes, if you're familiar with them in other languages. They're basically just a list of properties um, and you can give them a type, and they all have names. So here's a record of a person um, with a first name, last name, and number of cats. I only have one cat. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can call methods that take a record in, um, and you can see you can access the fields in the record with a dot syntax. So it's kind of like an object in JavaScript, but it's just a way of holding together the data for that thing. You can also have type aliases. So this is different from a record because you can see with the record, we set these things equal to values, the first, last, and string. But the type alias person is now just saying that anything that has a first, last, um, and cats is a person. So you can now use that in a function rather than like the bottom example here where you have to list out all of the fields that you're expecting, you can just say person. And a cool thing about type aliases is behind the scenes they give you a constructor, which is a method that returns a person. So it takes a string, a string, and an int, and it gives you a person, which means you can create a new person like this example here. Those methods can be handy. We'll see that as we go through the demo. Elm also has union types, and you can think of them a little bit like enumerations in some languages, but really what union types are, are a way to deal with weird data shapes in a pleasant way. Um, they are also called tagged unions in some functional programming languages, or ADTs, but really what they are is a list of things that something can be. So if you have a type user, um, you can have an anonymous user, or you can have a named user, or you can have a numbered user. And you can see that named comes with um, a name, and numbered comes with an int. And so behind the scenes, again, you get some constructors. You get a constructor for an anonymous user, and really that's just anonymous, and that returns a user type. You get a constructor for named, which takes a name and returns a user type. And you get a constructor for numbered, which takes an int and returns a user type. These are the only ways you can get a user type, is by using the constructors of the 
um, the values inside of there. Also, you can see at the top, I did something that may seem a little bit silly, but I aliased a na name to string. Um, and it's just a string, so it doesn't really need an alias, but it's kind of nice when you're looking through these things to give things a nice name so that you know what you're looking at. Here's another example of a union type. And this one's interesting because it has these strange lowercase letters. So if you have an answer of type A, um, you can have, it can either be a yes, no, or an other of type A. So again, if you think of it in, in terms of the constructors that we get, um, you can think of it as getting a yes constructor and a no, and they both give you an answer of type A. But if, what the cool thing is, is when you decide to make an answer of some kind, you give it a type. So you can make named answer be an answer string, and then named answer could be yes, named answer could be no, or it could be other goats. The only rule is the types must match where those lowercase letters are. So if you want an answer string, then anything in there that has that A also must be a string. But it's a nice way of like making something that works with more than one type. So here, you could have an answer int, and then an answer int could either be yes, no, or other 100. Elm also has tuples, and these are just sort of like buckets of data. Um, they can be any type. And I don't use them a lot because you can put a lot of things in there and you can't name them. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you don't necessarily know what's there. But you will see them in the demo because some of the um, Elm libraries use them. So I thought I should mention that they are a thing. Elm has some control flow. It's pretty basic. And if then else statement looks like this, which is not that different from other languages. And if you want to know more, um, you can always look at the basics. Um, the, the Elm documentation is pretty great. And you can see in the basics, this lists all of the stuff that you get without importing anything. Um, so this will be where you've got all your operators and you've got um, just like basic max and min, compare to string. These are things that you get for free. Um, the rest of this stuff is in core that's over here on the right. Oops. We'll look at the latest. Um, so you've got array, bitwise, char, color, date, debug, et cetera. You have all of these things in core. Um, and you can use any of these uh, by importing core, but you have to import that library into your uh, Elm module in order to use it. And you'll see that in the demo. So just keep that in mind. And here we go onto the code. And I'm a little bit sad that this isn't working because now I'll have to like sort of turn around to type. And I, I'm sorry. Um, but we will try to make this as nice as possible. I had this all set up for more monitors, so didn't work out that way. Sublime, because I'm old. Um, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of really great uh, Elm tools for Atom. So if you like Atom, then that's a really great editor to use if you're going to be working in Elm. I'm going to face this way. Um, let's see. I do know how to use technology, I promise, sort of. I like to talk to it anyway. Um, OK. So the first thing we'll do, I just want to make sure. There 
we go. The first thing we'll do is create a file to put our Elm in. So that's pretty easy. And we already have Sublime open, but I need to be here. Okay. So here's our file. It doesn't have anything in it. Um, let me know if you guys can read it once we start typing. This is what the text looks, looks like. And if it's too small, just yell at me. You think it looks all right? Okay, good. Okay, so um, if you start compiling this already, you can see that Elm doesn't like it. Um, this blank file is a problem. It doesn't know what to do with it. It's looking for one of these things. Um, it's looking for a definition or a type annotation, a module declaration, a port, a type, an import, and a fix in a white space. So, you know, um, that's a list of things that you might not necessarily know anything about, but without trying too hard, let's just guess that it wants a function and say, hello world, of course, because that's what we do. Hey, that's pretty cool. So I just hit save and um, both Sublime Text and the tools for Atom will do this, and I believe some of the tools for other languages will as well. There's something called Elm Format. So Elm is very opinionated about what its code should look like, which can be nice because there's never any argument about it. And usually you just run Elm Format automatically, which means when you check code in, there's not like white space issues in your diff and that sort of thing. And it makes it nice and easy to work with. Um, but one of the other cool things that Elm Format did is it put this in a module for me because it knew that I needed that. So that's pretty cool. Let's see if this compiles now. Hmm, no, not quite. We have a missing type annotation, which is just a warning, and we have an error that we have a bad main type. So we can't return a string from main is what this is telling me. It says that it needs HTML, SVG, or program. So we'll have to do something about that. Um, luckily, Elm provides an HTML library. So we are going to add that. I did mention that Elm has a package manager, so that's what we're gonna use to add it. Um, the HTML library is not part of core, but which seems a little bit weird to me, but it's kind of makes sense too, because you could also use the SVG library to make a GUI interface. There's a couple of them that work for this. But, um, so if you wanna make a web page, you're always gonna be installing this package. Um, but it's pretty easy to use and pretty similar to many other package installers. But it's also very polite. It asks if you approve of the plan. So yes, we do approve of the plan. It's gonna install Elm Lang HTML, core, which it needs, and virtual DOM, which is where the magic happens, but you will never deal with that directly, probably. And so it configures the packages, so that's pretty great. The other thing that we get is we now have Elm stuff. And that's where I put all the packages it downloaded. Uh, you can see we got the Elmlang library. And in there is core, HTML, and virtual DOM. And we also got an Elm package.json, which we'll look at in here. And then again, this is like other package managers. Um, versioning is very important in Elm. We talked about this a little bit in some other talks today, but what's kind of nice with Elm in the package manager is that that actually can enforce semantic versioning. You can be sure that you won't break your code um, as long as you stay within a version because it does not allow package managers to upload something that does not have types that match the prior version. Um, without changing the version number. So that's pretty great. It makes it a lot easier to move forward and make sure that you always have the right stuff. All right, so we were just taking a look at that. And now that we have HTML, we're gonna want to use it. And to use it, we're gonna have to import it. And you can expose everything but it's kind of nice when you're learning to just expose things I think as you need them, because then you know where they are and you know where to look to find information about them. Um, one of the things that Elm Lang support gives you, 
and I believe it's the same in Atom, is a type panel. So all you have to do is hover or have your mouse on something and then look at it and it tells you a little bit about what it is. So HTML.HTML um, is a virtual DOM node of type message. So that's the lowercase generic type that we saw in the union types there. Um, and it's the core building block used to build up HTML. We don't really need to know a lot about virtual DOM nodes because that's behind the scenes stuff. This is the lowest level that you generally deal with when you're working with Elm. But it gives us a cool little example here. We can see that in order to get this back, we need to use a method like div or text. Um, so let's go ahead and import those two. And we'll make our main look like the example. And let's see if this compiles. And it's a lot better. Now we only have a warning. Um, so like I said, the type annotations are not necessary, but I found them really useful, and I like to keep them in my code because it makes it easy to just read through the code without having to think about it too much, especially as your apps get larger. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that and take a look at it again, and now it's successfully built, so that's pretty great. But if you notice, the, the build tool just generated in DevNull right now, <laughs> and that's just what this plugin for Sublime Text does, unless you do it this way instead, run. And now we actually built HTML. I thought it built JS. But let's take a quick look at it. And you can see that it did build this giant file here, and it's a lot of JavaScript inside an HTML doc. So if you wanted to do just an LMAP that's a page by itself, this is a way to do it. You can see at the very end, the magic that kind of makes it happen is in the body here, this is all of the body, and that's just calling L main full screen with JavaScript. So that's sort of how you add a component in to your HTML. That's not super exciting though. A lot of times we're gonna be making a small component and putting it in an existing application, so I'm just gonna go ahead and delete this, <laughs> and we're gonna do something a little bit different. Oh. I did want to look at it in the browser. We'll do that real quick. Just so you can see what this hello world looks like. Ta-da! So that's all it takes to do hello world in Elm. That's not a lot of code. And I think, personally, it's a lot easier than setting up something like React, um, where you need to get webcap, webpack running and all the other stuff. And I find it a lot less intimidating. Um, so, I think that's one of the really great things about Elm. Um, but, like I said, we want to try this in an existing app and make this a component. So, I'm going to copy over an index.html that I already had, because there's no need in talking about that too much. Um, or we've got some styling and a tiny body, but this is the magic here. We can compile Elm to JavaScript, just a file by itself, and then if you want to embed it on a page that exists, all you need to do is call Elm main embed and give it an element to embed it into. So we're going to put it in that div called with an ID of app. And to do this, we're going to use a different tool rather than the Sublime plugin to build this because it's not that much fun, to be honest with you, to build manually every time and have to refresh the page, and I'd rather have live reload because it feels really great to use. So um, we're gonna do Elm Live, and Elm Live Reload is easy to install. You can install it with npm. Um, Main.elm, so that's the file we wanna compile, and you just tell it the output, and we're gonna make it be elm.js because that's what we put in our HTML file. And it starts up a server for us with live reload running. So now we can look at it, and it's cow spotted because I promised my coworker that there would be cows. So, <laughs> so there are cows, and it's hello world, and that doesn't look that great, so I think I wanna make that a heading instead of just a div. So I'm gonna take a wild guess that that's H1. Hey look, there is an H1. You'll notice that the Elm um, view code 
looks an awful lot like HTML. And it, it's, it, it is. It's like, it's just, these are all functions. Every HTML tag is a function that takes attributes and then um, an array of nodes. So basically, if it's an HTML tag, it's probably also a method in HTML, which is pretty cool. But yeah, so we save this as a h1. And we see it's still compiling. And now it's a little bigger. So yay. OK. <laughs> I'm also going to do something real quick. Now that we're compiling to ElmJS, I don't want to commit that. So I'm going to add it here to my git ignore file. So this will not be added to my um, repository. Cool. Let's see. So that's pretty cool, but it doesn't do anything. So what's the point of using Elm? You could just do that in HTML really easily. So let's do something a little bit more interesting. Do you remember the architecture? Um, most of the time, people just sort of copy that in and go from there. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start with the model, because let's decide that we want um, our data to represent this title here. So all we want to do is have some data that represents a title. That's a string. That's pretty easy. Um, so let's uncomment this. And let's say model is a string. This is like the very simple one I had in the demo. And you can see Elm format made it look like this. Um, it likes to have a lot of white space, which at first was annoying because it makes your files real long. But actually, it's really nice to read. So I came to really like it um, in the end. But it's very opinionated about that. And the other thing that I'd like to do here is something we don't have to do. But I've noticed when I've shown this to people, um, occasionally things can be confusing because model is called model. And this isn't anything special. Um, this does not have to be called model. I'm going to name it edoc model instead, just because I want to show that this can be anything that you want. It doesn't have to be model. But it's still a model, so we're just going to call it edoc model. All right, let's see. Are we still compiling? Yep. So next, let's keep moving on and filling out our view, because we know what that's going to be. We already made a view up here. So I'm just going to grab this and put it down here. And instead of hard-coded text, let's make this be our model. So now, whatever we pass in, I'm going to uncomment that, um, will be in our heading. Everything in Elm message, MSG is everywhere, so sorry <laughs> about that. <laughs> um, uh, but again, I'm probably going to rename this, because it doesn't have to be MSG. But that's just a very common um, shortening that's used in Elm. You'll notice that in the update, in the commented section, we're going to have a union type that's in MSG, which is very interesting. And if you look up here, there's a lowercase one up at the top, which is also mysterious, but We'll worry about that later. OK, so all that's left is the update. And we already noticed that we need a union type called message. And I'm going to change this to edoc message. And for the update, the union type that you're going to need just needs to be a list of all of the things that can happen in your application. So basically, this is describing the capabilities of your application as data. So it's just going to be a list of actions. Um, so let's just do something silly. How about when we click on the title? We'll do title clicked. And that doesn't take anything because it's just a click. So we don't need to describe that data in any way. And we'll definitely need to change this view signature to match because this is going to be able to emit um, these and send them to Elm. And then we'll be able to handle them in our update later. So we'll make sure that those match. And last but not least, the update method. If you remember the slides about the Elm architecture, this is sort of like the map, the big green bar that was in the middle. This is the thing that's going to take our model, which is a string, and 
send it to our view. So we can modify it any way we need to. Um, and later, there are other things that we can do as well. Not yet. But we're going to make this simple, because right now, we're not actually doing anything. So I'm just going to return a model, because we see it takes in a message and a model. Technically, sort of two methods, but you could do it all at once. And it returns a model. So we're going to return a model, and let's see what I'll make things. Could not find type model. Hmm. That's because I changed the name. So it's very helpful. <laughs> and now it's compiling again. So that's pretty great. Let's take a look at it over here. It looks pretty much the same, and it still doesn't do anything, even though we've added all this code. Hmm. I think we'll have to add some more. What's missing is that we're not tying this stuff together anywhere. In the main, we're just returning this HTML type message. So we're going to have to tie together our model, update, and view. HTML gives us something to do that called beginner program, which is a pretty great way to start using Elm. And the beginner program takes the model. It'll take the initial model, actually. And we know we want this to start with something. So let's say, hello, eerie day of code. Yay. <laughs> that was Elm format reloading it for me. Um, and the view is actually going to be this view method. So it needs something that takes a model and returns HTML. So we'll pass in that view method. And then our update is just our update method. And let's see now if this is compiling. <gasps> it's not. So this is a little big. Can't see the whole thing. Now our definition of main does not match its type annotations. So here's the thing. If you put type annotations in, they have to match. Um, and we made it be HTML message. But it's not that anymore. Now we're getting back a program never string edoc message. That's a lot of stuff. Um, but you know what? We don't have to worry about it. We can actually just copy it and put it in for now. And then we can look at it a little bit later and see if we can figure out what all that means. All right, are we compiling again? Yep. Yay, it's hello, eerie day of code. So that's how that works. But we still aren't doing anything. And that's because we don't have anything in our update that actually changes anything. So that's what's next. Um, in order to do that, we're going to have to be able to register a click event. So how are we going to get that from our web page? We're clicking here, and that doesn't know about it. Well, the HTML library has pretty much all the events that you would expect to see if you were working on a web page. So again, these are just methods, like they would be in JavaScript. Or all of the properties are just methods here. So our model is going to want, let's see, when we click this title, we want it to do whatever we define for title clicked. So on click is going to say title clicked, because that's a edoc message. And that's basically how this works. So you can kind of just plug this stuff in. And again, we're still compiling, but it doesn't do anything because we're not actually handling that here. Now, Elm has something called a case statement, Oops. which is very useful for dealing with union types. No, it's trying to be too smart. Um, because what happens here is if you compile it, it will tell you if you don't have a case for everything that's in there. So for example, if there was another event that could happen, and I save this, you can see the compiler is complaining that we need to account for the following values in another event. So in other words, it doesn't let you forget any cases. 
you have to account for everything. So you can't have any accidental nulls or anything like that happening. There is no null, by the way. There are maybes, um, which we might get to later. But <laughs> we'll see how far we get. So that's pretty great. And here now, um, we can see whenever we get a message and it's title clicked, we're just returning the model, which again isn't too exciting. Let's just add some excitement to it. So we'll just add exclamation points or something. So we can click it, and now there's exclamation points. So that's all you need to do to make your page interactive. And basically, yeah, this is stuff that you could do in JavaScript, but now it's also giving you your HTML too. Eventually there might be CSS stuff, but that's sort of like gone back and forth a bit. It'd be cool if it was all together and then you could make sure that you didn't miss anything, but. Okay, so this is pretty cool, but you notice if you look, play with this, now you, it's kind of ridiculous, that's too much excitement, and we can't go back because we didn't put in anything to do that. So let's change this so that we can have, say, like a level of excitement or something like that. And what if we did it by using key presses? If you pressed a number, it made the excitement level that number. Okay, let's do that. So we can't listen for key presses just with what we've got here. But if we want to, there's an Elm library to do it for us. And it's called Keyboard. And it lets you listen to global keyboard events. Um, and this library is really small, which is nice. A lot of Elm libraries are. Uh, makes it really easy to understand them pretty quickly. But you can see that it has a type alias for, alias for key codes, which is an int. That kind of makes sense. Each key is represented by an integer. Um, and it has three subscriptions, presses, downs, and ups. Subscriptions are interesting, and we can't use them yet. OK. <laughs> so this is taking longer than I expected, but that's OK. Um, I'm going to go a little bit faster and just go ahead and install this package real quick. Okay, and we'll start up our server again. And over here. We've switched over to a non-beginner program. The regular program can also handle subscriptions. And I'm sorry, I'm going to go kind of fast here because we're kind of running out of time. But I'm just going to show you how you can build up a more interactive um, application fairly quickly. So I'll just step through all of these changes. And now you can see that we have a key pressed message. And you can see we have a subscription method that we give the program. And all it does is it says whenever there's a keyboard down, key pressed. And in our update, we aren't handling that yet. So let's see. We'll handle that here. Not doing anything yet. Oh, you can see that we also get a command none. So when you have a regular application, it's got subscriptions and commands. Subscriptions are what you listen to, and commands are a way of telling Elm that you want to actually do something in the outside world. So here the subscription is listening to the outside world for key presses, and um, commands would be telling it to do something, but we don't have any yet. So we're not doing anything um, with the outside world with any of these events. So now we're getting the key press, and let's see. Here we go. If we have a number key, we set the excitement level. And now we're adding, we're using a method on string to repeat the excitement level with exclamation points. And you can see this is how you change a model, um, or a, a record type. So that's another little bit of syntax that we didn't really go over, but it's there. And let's take a look here. Oh, looks like I have a make failed. Uh, my Elm stuff directory. Oh, because I, I'm skipping around. Well, we can fix that. Well, I keep updating stuff and breaking it. So maybe the best thing to do is to just kind of skip to the end and go through. OK, because this is also for Mario. I wanted to get to the end. It's uh, Cow Chan, Cow Channel, uh, dubbed Cow Chan by Jake. 
And it's a little bit dangerous because these are some random GIFs, but G-rated only. Oops. We don't need to do that again. So we'll see what happens. Server running. Do I need to refresh? OK, here we go. Let's see. It's waiting. That's not a cow. There we go. Now it's getting random cows every few seconds. And um, we still have our excitement level happening here with the keyboard presses. And uh, <laughs> lots of cows. And you can watch them all day. Um, the code isn't very large for that whole thing. And you can see, basically, we get another subscription for time. We tell it to change GIF. And then for getting a cow GIF, we get to use HTTP requests. And um, that's this, which is not that complicated, but means that you have to deal with both the OK, like you actually got a, a good response or an error. And it doesn't let you not, because the request type is a union type of OK and error. So that's one of the ways that it sort of encodes you have to deal with everything. Um, and since I have to wrap this talk up, that's pretty much it. And like I said, go ahead and feel free to ping me on Twitter if you want to chat about any Elm. I can show, talk to you more about it. Or cows, although Mario's the expert, and I don't know why we get that one, but it's Giphy, so what can I say? That's it. <laughs>